What is light? Light is fundamental to our interaction with the natural world, and yet what it really is remains a mystery to many. The answer is incredible. If you took physics in high school, you were probably taught that light is a ray. When I turn a source of light on, like a light bulb, rays of light travel out in straight lines in all directions, bouncing off everything in the room. Some of this light enters my eye and I see it. This explains why, when you look into a mirror, what you can see depends on the angle which the mirror makes with your eye. As humans, we very quickly learned that the ray description of light could not be the whole picture. When light travels through a piece of glass, or through a slit which is very thin, we notice that the light does something very peculiar. When light is incident on an interface between different substances like air and glass, the rays of light bend sharply, by an angle which depends on the properties of the substances and the incident angle. When light from a laser passes through a slit which is very thin, say half a micrometer, the very thin beam spreads out to form a pattern with very particular properties. Certainly, the light rays aren't travelling in straight lines anymore. Physicists realised that these two phenomena could be explained by considering light as a wave. When a wave passes through an interface where it moves slower in one substance than another, it deflects. The same thing happens when a water wave passes through a container of varying depth. Similarly, if a wave passes through a very thin slit, it spreads out, and bumps into itself, interfering and producing a pattern of varying intensity on the wall in front of it. It was settled then. Light was a wave which propagates through space, very quickly, and interferes with itself. But this couldn't be the whole truth either. If you turn down the brightness of a red light source very low and connect a light sensor pointed at it to a speaker, something incredible happens. You'll hear clicks. Clicks of the same volume, randomly spaced apart. If you turn the brightness back up, the frequency but not the volume of the clicks will increase. If you make the light more blue, the loudness of the clicks will increase but not the number of them. The only explanation physicists could provide was that light must be made of little particles, called photons, which each have an energy which depends on how blue they are. The brightness of a beam of photons then depends on how many there are in the beam. At this point, high school you is super confused. You just finished your last optics class and are certain that you're less sure you know what light is than when you started. You ask, what is it then, a particle or a wave? Your teacher waves their hands around a little bit and says, it's the wave-particle duality. It's both. Class dismissed. What? That doesn't help at all. While it's true that light and many other small objects can be made to behave like both a wave and a particle, it's most correct to say that light is divided into packets or quanta of energy. For a beam of a particular colour, this amount of energy is always constant. This modern theory of light is known as quantum electrodynamics, and it provides the most complete description of light that we have. Its predictions are best investigated by analogy with classical theories. Suppose we set up Young's double slit experiment. We'll place a light source here, cut two holes in a wall here and here to produce two slits, and we'll set up a screen at the back to measure the intensity of the light which arrives at the other side. Famously, when the light is bright, we'll see a wave interference pattern form on the screen. What if we turn down the brightness so that only one photon of light is being emitted at a time? Well, we'll record the positions where the photons collide with the detector over time, and we'll plot a graph of the result. Lo and behold, an identical pattern appears. This is incredible, because only one photon passed through the double slit setup at a time. In fact, the only possible explanation is that each photon interfered with itself as it passed through the slits. In some sense, each photon passed through both slits, before deciding where it would arrive on the screen. Quantum electrodynamics cannot predict where each photon will collide, but it can instead predict the probability that a photon will arrive at a particular place. The process by which physicists calculate this probability is remarkable. They simply find the square of the length of an arrow, called the probability amplitude, associated with ending up at a particular point. The arrow is found by placing an infinite number of smaller arrows, one for each possible path the photon could take through space in order to arrive at a particular place, head to tail. The smaller arrows have a length corresponding to the length of the path they are associated with, shorter paths make longer arrows, and they rotate as the photon travels through space along its path. For red light, the arrows rotate 15,000 times in a centimetre, or 38,000 times in an inch. To illustrate this process, let's look at a flat mirror. 
we'll place a source of photons at A and a detector at B. Obviously we don't want photons to be able to get to the detector directly, so we'll put a wall between them. The mirror will go down here. Now all we're left to do is draw an infinite number of arrows, one for each possible path from A to B, and we're done! Ah, oh, that's hard to do graphically. For one, the arrows are all infinitely short, so when they add up the result isn't infinitely long. And second, there are a lot of them. Fortunately, with the immense power of calculus, performing this process is very possible. Though, the mathematical formalism is quite elaborate, and contains many technical details, such as the precise length of each arrow, which don't matter for the purposes of this example. So, in order for us to bring our intuition to bear on what's going on here, we'll have to make a few simplifications. One, we'll only consider paths which bounce off the screen. Although this, 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 and this are all possible paths, they all almost cancel out, and you'll see why later. And two, even with this simplification, we actually still have an infinite number of possible paths, so we'll divide the mirror up into a finite number of segments and compute an arrow for each segment. Then we can add up all of the arrows, and we'll be done. So, the first segment has a path like this from A to B, with an arrow, say, pointing in this direction, and with this length. The amount the length each arrow differs by here is very small, so we're going to ignore it. Then the second segment has this path, and this arrow. We can keep drawing arrows for each possible path, like this, noticing that around the centre of the mirror, the path length changes very little, and thus the arrows turn less than at the edges. Alright, placing the arrows end to end, we get this structure, with this final arrow, or probability amplitude. This arrow is very long, which means that the probability of a photon arriving at B from A is very great. Thus, we have shown that in our quantum model, light sort of bounces off the mirror like a ray. Now, the reason we were able to ignore, for example, this path, was that it has a neighbour path which has almost the same length and whose arrow points in the opposite direction, cancelling themselves out. This is true for any arbitrary squiggly path we can come up with. We can actually make the photon look like a wave, too, if we cut out parts of the mirror where the arrows point in a very particular direction. Now the arrows for the pieces of the mirror still in place form semicircles, and we get an extra long arrow. This chopped up mirror is called a diffraction grating, and before quantum mechanics, it was explained using wave interference ideas. To finish off our investigation, let's look at the double slit experiment again, now from the quantum perspective. If we pick a point on the screen, say, this one, we can work out the probability that a photon will arrive there by adding up arrows. Again, we choose to ignore arbitrary paths like this, because by making a small modification to the path, we can cancel it out. Because the slits are so thin, we can say that there's only one path which goes through each slit, and thus, only two arrows which contribute to the probability amplitude of arriving there, one for each slit. Thus, we get a total probability amplitude of zero for this particular place. Interestingly, we can actually translate our quantum interpretation into the wave-based one used to explain the results of this experiment originally. If we consider the up-down component of the arrows for each slit to be the height of a wave along each path, we see that the arrows, and that's the wave heights, oscillate as we move down the path from each slit to the screen. In other words, we can imagine waves to be spreading out from the photon, through the slits, and onto the screen, interfering, and in this case, cancelling out. Really though, these wave properties are just a consequence of the quantum rules which govern where the photon might end up, and the photon will always only end up in exactly one place. Extraordinarily, it has been proven in Bell's inequality that the path each photon actually takes through the slits is impossible to completely determine in theory without actually getting in the way and measuring it. Modern physicists have forfeited the idea of determinism, that if the complete state of the universe were mathematically written down, we still couldn't predict the future, only the likelihood of a particular outcome over others. So, what's the modern answer to what light is? Well, Light consists of a whole number of energy packets, called photons. They behave randomly, but physicists can figure out the probabilities of where they are by adding up little arrows for each possible path to calculate a probability amplitude. So, where light ends up depends on every possible path it can take. One interpretation of this is that the photons interfere with themselves and really take every possible path simultaneously. They only decide where they are when they interact with something else, like a detector. These rules are true for all light, even that which comes great distances from the sun to end up in your eye, and for you to see it. But how that happens is a whole other explanation. Hopefully your understanding of light has been illuminated.